Welcome to the Lighthouse Identity Project. We are so glad to have you with us here today. We are doing something that most churches are not, and that is we are embracing the journey of sanctification in the Holy Spirit. We are talking about things such as growing in Christ, discipleship, fellowship, all of these things, growth in the Holy Spirit that leads us to a life that has victory in the fullness of Jesus Christ. And the things that would show proof of that is peace, life, hope, joy, a, a victory-filled life that always has people that are coming to us and that we are always reaching out and sharing the gospel also. It's not something that's guilt-ridden. It's something that naturally happens because of the overflow of the Holy Spirit. It is not something that most churches are embracing right now, but it's something every church we feel should. So we're glad to have you with us. We are going to be back in just a couple seconds. We've got a worship song that we are not going to post on the recording, but we'll see you in a couple seconds for our first section today. See you soon. All right, so welcome back. So we are in our first section of tonight's service, and our first section, our focus is on you. Our focus is on understanding ourselves so that we can come into the fullness of what God calls us into. We have a purpose. We have an identity. We have a union with God that is unbelievably awesome, but most Christians do not know how to embrace it. They have legally access to that, but they do not know how to come into the fullness of it and truly live in it. And so we've been using the armor of God as something that kind of has guided us through this, this first section or this first part of it has been focusing in on what it takes to strengthen our shield of faith. Because shield of faith, and we have a graphic for that, the shield of faith has three parts to it, as we've talked about, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and then the uh, God's word that ultimately makes our feet ready uh, for battle. And so those three things, when those three things are strong, then we have a strong shield of faith that is able to withstand the fiery arrows or darts that Satan throws at us. If we don't have strength in those first three areas, if we really don't understand that, then our shield is weak and we are defeated over and over and over again. It's unfortunate because we're not living in and utilizing the very things that God gives us access to. So, understanding the belt of truth. First of all, we have to commit to truth. We have to be dedicated to truth. We have to take our side up with truth, which means also righteousness. And we know that our, our yes, our righteous, our righteousness is determined through Christ's righteousness. But however, what does righteous living even mean? Holiness. So understanding the importance of holiness, of following God, of obedience to God. What is, it's a commitment to justice, righteousness. That's part of the truth. If Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, all of these things of commitment to the characteristic of who God is. And so knowing that our righteousness is in Christ and we have to understand what his character is then also at the same point. And so the gospel, the word of God makes us ready to understand what all those things are. And we have to embrace those things to understand what the belt of truth is, a commitment to righteousness, to justice, to what is true. So... First thing that we're going to look at today, I've been going back and forth between Victory Over Darkness and then the other book that we're going to start to look at is by Robert, Robert Mulholland Jr. and it's called Invitation to a Journey. We should have a graphic for that as well. So I'm going to read um, just a little bit of the first chapter, I believe is what we're looking at today. It's chapter one and in my book we're going to look at page 23 where it talks about option or necessity and this is what... Robert Mulholland is someone who a passed recently. He's an amazing writer that his, both his books, The Invitation to a Journey and The Deeper Journey are amazing books on spiritual formation and highly recommend that you get those. We will be looking at The Invitation to a Journey on and off going back between that and The Victory Over Darkness. He talks about here on page 23, he says, once we begin to realize that genuine spiritual growth is a continuous and sometimes difficult process, we may be tempted to think that it is an option we can take or leave. For many Christians, the quest for the deeper life in Christ is viewed as a discipline for dedicated disciples, a pursuit of the 
particularly pious, a spiritual frill for those who have the time or inclination, a spiritual fad for trendy Christians. We fail to realize that the process of spiritual shaping is a primal reality of human existence. Everyone is in a process of spiritual formation. Every thought we hold, every decision we make, every action we take, every emotion we allow to shape our behavior, every response we make to the world around us, every relationship we enter into, every reaction we have toward the things that surround us and impinge upon our lives, all of these things little by little are shaping us into some kind of being. We are being shaped into either the wholeness of the image of Christ or a horribly destructive caricature of that image. Destructive not only to ourselves, but also to others. For we inflict our brokenness upon them. That is so important for us to understand. We are being shaped into either the wholeness of the image of Christ or a horribly destructive character of that image. Destructive not only to ourselves but also to others for we inflict our brokenness upon them. This wholeness or destructiveness radically conditions our relationship with God, ourselves and others. As we, as well as our involvement in the dehumanizing structures and dynamics of the broken world around us. We become either agents of God's healing and liberating grace or carriers of the sickness of this world. The direction of our spiritual growth infuses all we do with intimations of either life or death. Gosh, it's powerful. We either are become agents of God's healing and liberating grace. We are people, agents, or um, uh, yeah, mediators. We are, um, I can't think of the word that Paul talks about, but um, we are ambassadors. That's the word. Ambassadors for reconciliation to Christ. And we do that through his spirit that works in us. As we grow in Christ, then we are representatives of the, of the kingdom of God and agents of his grace, living it out, growing in Christ, continually participating in the advancement of his kingdom. Or if we choose to not grow, then we continue to grow in our our destructive behavior that is molded by this world. And I've heard people say that, well, I, I, I am made holy in Christ the moment that I accept Christ. Legally, yes. However, your life has not changed one bit. Well, I have the Spirit of God dwelling within me. You do. And that Spirit will immediately start to guide you into growth in Christ. If we don't recognize that it's there and follow it, then we've shown that we really don't follow Jesus. We don't have faith in Jesus because we're not willing to surrender to his presence that now dwells within us in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not legalism. It's a matter of surrender and following. If we fall, we get grace and God works with us, but he continues to move us more and more into that growth. And if we don't know that that presence is there and how to respond to it and to be growing in it, to surrender to it, to be molded by it, then we will continue to be molded by the surrounding around us, which is already the world. So we continue in our destructive behaviors. And this book talks to us and shows us what are those destructive behaviors like. I want to continue though. Um, in what he says here, the last couple of paragraphs in this chapter. Right. C.S. Lewis states it in his inimitable way. Every time you make a choice, you are turning the central part of you, that part of you that chooses into something a little different from what it was before. And taking your life as a whole with you, with all your innumerable choices all your life long you are slowly turning the central thing either into a heavenly creature or into a hellish creature either into a creature that is in harmony with God and with other creatures 
and with self, or else into one that is in a state of war and hatred with God and with its fellow creatures and with itself, to be the one kind of creature in heaven that is, it is joy and peace and knowledge and power. To be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and eternal loneliness. Each of us at each moment is progressing to one state or the other. That is extremely important. I have people that have, I, I've heard and they've said, Derek, you, this whole maturing in Christ, that's for you. But you know, not all Christians, it's not for all Christians. Not all Christians find that interesting. You know, that's boring to me. I, I think that's great that this is, a, this is your thing. This is your, you know, fad and your thing that you like to do. But it's not for everybody. Not according to what Mulholland is talking about here. We were created to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And when it does, we are excited and moving into a place of healing and strength and power. If we're not interested in it, we're not ready for that. We're not ready for Christ. We want eternal life, but we don't want the surrender. We want cheap grace. We want grace without suffering. We want grace without the cross. We want grace without surrender. And that does not exist. That is deception. That is a lie. So he says here, spiritual formation is not an option. The inescapable conclusion is that life itself is a process of spiritual development. The only choice we have is whether that growth moves us toward wholeness in Christ or toward an increasingly dehumanized and destructive mode of being. The Christian journey, therefore, is an intentional and continual commitment to a lifelong process of growth toward wholeness in Christ. It is a process of growing up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from Ephesians 4.15. Until we attain to mature personhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ from Ephesians 4.13. It is for this purpose that God is present and active in every moment of our lives. We move constantly in a direction of being, and he talks about again, where we are in this world is a destructive agent that inflicts pain on other people for my benefit. It's a greedy thing. Controlling the chaos that's happening around us and manipulating others for my benefit. And what happens is that we are trying to control everything, but we were never meant to, and it never works. Ultimately, all we get is more irritated, angry, depressed hopeless as far as in all in in our future because we realize that it's out of our control the worst thing that could happen to us is that our lives be blessed and us feel like we are doing well because it feeds the deception but eventually it's going to catch up eventually it will end up finding us and we will find that it all amounts to nothing think about it People that have all the money in the world. What was that? Jobs? Uh, creator of, uh, of Apple. I mean, he, he had just incredible amount of money. And he, I, I think he'd even said that he, he, would, he would give it all away just for his health to come back. He made a choice in trying to go after, he had beliefs that were not in Christ. And his beliefs didn't come through for him. He died. What good is all of that money now? Does he take it with him? I guess some beliefs think so. Well, his hope didn't save his life here. And I hope that it does better for him afterwards. But here's the deal. What God says is that when we put our faith in something today, him, that there is an immediate effect of it. Peace, love, Joy, hope, strength, power, healing, health. Lord, 
brings us into his presence more and more and more. However, in order for us to go through that, to come into that, we have to be willing to die to self. We have to be willing to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. We have to be willing to suffer in order to come in to true life. And that is something that often makes people say, not worth it. Not worth it. That's a choice. That's our choice. But that is also what Jesus commands us. Look in the New Testament. That's not an Old Testament thing. It's a New Testament thing. Follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me. And those who want to be born again, ultimately, um, they must be willing to follow Jesus, even through death itself, to be able to come into the new life that he offers. Spiritual formation is not something that's an option because if we choose not to do it, then we basically say to God, I'm not interested in what you're doing. So the person that says, Derek, that's just not for me. What they're ultimately saying is, I'm not ready to surrender to Christ. I'm not ready to be a Christian yet. Well, yeah, I mean, I want eternal life. And yes, I go to church and I'll tithe and I'll serve and stuff and I'll do all these things. And God is graceful and he'll forgive me for a while, for a while. But those are the ones that basically the seed has fallen upon the, the rocks. They've fallen upon the weeds. They got a taste of it, but they basically, they strayed. The good soil is the only one that makes it into heaven. Good soil is the only one that really embraces the Holy Spirit and the only one that bears fruit tenfold, thirtyfold, hundredfold, whatever. Um, we have to decide. And if we're not ready to follow Christ, we shouldn't say that we are. When we say that I am going to be a Christian, it's saying, you are my Lord and Savior. I follow you. I live under your rules. And yes, he's patient with us. So for the person that says, well, I'm battling drug addiction and I'm trying, but it's hard and sometimes I fall. Does that mean that because I fall that I, I'm not with Jesus? No, it doesn't mean that. If we are taking a step with him and we're praying, God, help me with this. Help me to, to overcome this. This is hard. He will be patient with us, but ultimately he's going to, to be with us, walk with us, and he'll lead us to conquer it eventually. Um, but he'll, he's patient where patient is required. The person, though, that decides to walk a path that is basically says no to God as often as he taps us on our shoulders saying, hey, turn back, repent, turn to me. And we say, leave me alone. Eventually, we're not going to sense that tapping on the shoulder anymore. He's still there. He's still going to chase us down, but... We further that we keep straying, the more that it's harder for us to even sense God. And we start to feel the darkness consume us more and more and more. And these are the people that often I then work with in counseling. That they come to me and say, I used to have God's presence. I felt it. And then I'd say, you still have it. It's just you don't recognize it anymore. You're not able to, you've resisted it so much that to a certain degree you're in exile and we just got to bring you back out of exile. But at that point, still, what's the point of exile? Isn't the point of exile to remove all the idols, to strip away all the things that have basically taken us away from God, that, that we have brought in other things as God, and ultimately God says that's not okay? The answer is yes. It is to strip those things away so that we can have a pure relationship with him. And at that point, that's where a person that was a believer and a follower when they've strayed that they need someone else, else, another brother or sister to help walk with them and to guide them back into that presence of God. Many people that I've seen go through this and they come back into it and honestly, ultimately, hopefully that journey makes their experience of, of walking with God even that much more powerful because they've learned the hard way how to be able to come out of the darkness. And I will argue that those people, I believe, will make some of the greatest teachers. They will be the ones that they will walk with people and when they fall, they'll be able to be compassionate for them and to walk with them and be patient with them, but also stern with them as well. 
There are always consequences for our actions. God gives us grace. He gives us love. He gives us mercy. He gives us salvation. But there's even with forgiveness, there's still consequences in our lives for the actions that we take. And we need to understand that. So we are actually, in fact, that's something that has to do with the fear of the Lord. And we are doing a study on Tuesday nights about the fear of the Lord. So few people understand what that truly means. I mean, it's an eight-week study, so obviously it's a lot more than probably what most people think that the fear of the Lord is. I usually have people that'll, that'll follow up and just they'll talk about grace. We're not talking about grace in this. Grace is awesome. That's another story. But we're focusing in on the fear of the Lord because the fear of the Lord is something that helps us to be able to walk in holiness. God says, be holy because I am holy. That means if he's commanding us to walk with him, that's Old and New Testament. That means that we have a responsibility ourselves. He makes us in the righteousness of Christ through Christ. However, we're called to be sanctified into sanctification. That's a journey. It's a process. And we are called into that. And if we reject it, then we are rejecting the salvation of God. Salvation is means sanctification. That means that we follow the Holy Spirit and we grow in it. We need to take that seriously because if we don't, we're going to find ourselves consumed by darkness. And then we'll eventually, when we're in this devastation, either it will consume us and we might even take our own life or we finally turn and say, you know what, God, I've tried it my way. Now I'm going to do it your way. Teach me. And he will. That's going to conclude our first section here today. So we are going to take a break. We're going to go into section two. For those that are here, it's a time of fellowship, discipleship. If you are simply watching online or the recording of this, then we will see you in a few seconds for our section three, which is basically a sermon-like message, has a message and a video to start us off. So we'll see you in a couple of seconds. If you could go back to the city of Jerusalem during Bible times, the biggest thing you'd see is the temple. This beautiful building was designed by King David and built by King Solomon, and they believed that it was the home of the God of the universe. Wait, I thought God's home was in heaven. Well, the whole point of this earthly temple is that it's the place that overlaps with God's heavenly home. The temple is where God lives and rules all creation as king. That's cool, but... Even Solomon, who built the temple, didn't believe that it could contain the God of the universe, right? Yeah, the building was just a symbol, and it pointed to the fact that all of creation is God's temple. And that's actually what the first page of the Bible, Genesis 1, is all about. Really? It says that creation is God's temple? Well, it doesn't need to say it. The whole story shows it. In Genesis 1, God creates an ordered world out of a dark wasteland by speaking in a series of seven days. Then on the seventh day, God's presence fills creation as he takes up his rest and rule. Similarly, the tabernacle and later the temple were built and dedicated in a series of seven speeches in seven days, after which the priest or king could rest and rule in God's presence. Ah, so all of creation is where God intends to dwell. It's like his temple. Exactly. Now, turn the page to Genesis 2 and we get another portrait of creation. This one focuses in on the land. And in the center of the land is a region called Eden, which in Hebrew means delight. And in the middle of delight, God plants a garden in which God and humanity live together. And that's why the temple was modeled after the garden, filled with imagery of gold and flowers. The menorah symbolized the tree of life. It's the place where God dwells with his people. Oh, got it. And check this out. In the temple, the Israelite priests and Levites were to work and to keep the temple in God's presence. This is exactly the job description given to humanity in the Garden of Eden. So these humans were the first priests. But instead of ruling with God, they wanted to rule on their own terms. And they're exiled from the Garden Temple. And like Adam and Eve, Israel's leaders also wanted to rule on their own terms. And they too were exiled. The temple was destroyed, and this left them wondering, did God give up on Israel? Will God bring about a new creation? Well, the biblical prophets anticipated the day when God would create a new temple with a new priesthood. That's when God's presence would fill all of creation. And when the Israelites returned to the land, 
they did rebuild the temple. But that temple didn't turn out the way the prophets hoped. In fact, later Israelite prophets said that this temple was hopelessly corrupt. So they're still waiting for the ultimate temple. And here we come to the story of Jesus. He said that through him, God's presence and rule was coming into our world in a new way. And he presented himself as a new kind of priest. But Jesus wasn't a priest, and he didn't work in the temple. Right. Jesus said that God's presence, his rest and rule, was filling the world through his own life, death, and resurrection. Jesus was claiming that he was the true temple, and this new temple would expand out to include all of creation. That's a really big claim. And it got even bigger. After his resurrection, Jesus said that God's presence would come to dwell in and among his followers so that they would become mini temples. Communities of people where God rests and rules. Exactly. This is the Bible's vision of the church, which is described as a temple. Not a building, but people. Yeah, like when Peter says, you all are living stones built up as a temple for God's spirit to dwell. So at the end of the story, do we ever get a new physical temple? Well, not exactly. What we see is a renewed cosmic temple, just like Genesis 1. And this new creation doesn't need a temple building because through Jesus, all creation is now the place where God rests and rules the world with his people. All right, so the temple in the Exodus, it is first called tabernacle. The tabernacle is a mobile tent where God's presence dwells. Eventually, when they go into Jerusalem, then it will be a, a stone um, structure that is not movable, that is permanent, um, again, in Jerusalem. But the tabernacle is first given to Moses as a blueprint to build when he's on top of Mount Sinai. So the presence of God is the temple. It's his throne room where God lives with his people. And that's going to be really a centerpiece of our, of our text here today that we're looking at. We're looking at a lot of stuff. We're going to be looking at chapters for Exodus 23 through 31. And it's going to be a summary, so don't worry. I'm not going to go line by line like we usually do. Um, and it's going to be similar next week. We'll be kind of going from uh, 31 or 32 basically over into the rest of, uh, to the end of Exodus. So, and all of it has to do with God's presence. So, little background, we just finished the Ten Commandments, the boundaries not to go beyond, so to embrace God's presence. The first four had to do with God, a relationship um, between his people and Yahweh. And then the last six have to do with our relationship with one another. So chapters 20, uh, verse 22 through 23, verse 19 are a series of more laws that have to do with loving God and loving one another. And some of them can carry over to our culture today, and some of them don't. Some of them have to do with donkeys and oxes and slaves and all kinds of different things with that. But ultimately, there are more detailed ways of loving God and loving one another. Okay, so today we are going to be looking at, uh, we're starting in chapter 23, and it's chapter 23, verse 20. And so our first slide says this here. It says in verse 20, again, chapter 23, God says, Behold, I send an angel before you. This word can mean messenger. It definitely means angel, but um, either way, um, in this text, it means angel, but messenger also tells us what an angel is, a messenger of God as well. But to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared, pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies, an adversary to your adversaries. 
All right, so some interesting things happening here. First of all, again, he's sending an angel before them, okay? He's going to walk before them. He's going to go before them. And his purpose is to guard them and to bring them into the place that God has prepared. So guard them on the way, on the path, on the journey. The word guard means to keep, to watch over, to protect That is his role. And to bring them into the place that he has prepared for them. Bring is so to enter, to lead into. He is going to bring them into, not only, I mean, it is the land, the place that he has prepared, but it's ultimately to their purpose. That's where their land is, the covenant to fulfill that, to bring them all in. And so what's fascinating here, and I'm going to kind of lay my, my cards out here right away. This angel is definitely the angel of the Lord, no doubt about it. It says here that, his, his, that Yahweh's name is in him. There's only one angel that actually has that, and that's the angel of the Lord. And I've already also talked about how I do believe that Christ is the angel of the Lord. Jesus is the angel of the Lord before he came um, as, as, a, as a human uh, incarnate um, as Jesus. So pre-being a human in the form of Jesus, as called Jesus, um, he was before that the angel of the Lord. And so, like I said, um, what Jesus says in John 14, 1 is fascinating that parallels this whole idea of he's going to bring him to the place or bring them to the place that God has prepared. Jesus says in John 14, 1, this is the beginning of his farewell address right before he goes to the cross. This is what he says. This is how he starts it. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? What is the angel doing in the Exodus? Oh, he's going to bring them to the place that God has prepared. The same thing? Ultimately, yes, that's his job. The angel of the Lord is to bring God's people in, to guard them on the way, to protect them, and to Guide them into the place that God has prepared for them. So, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. That you, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus brings us into God's presence. Into the fullness of the covenant that God has given and made to us. He makes it possible so that we can be what it is that God has created us to be. Because apart from him, we can do nothing. Oh, there's another quote. That's actually part of the farewell address as well. In John 15, 5, the vine. So, pay careful attention to him. This literally means guard yourselves from his presence, from his face. Okay? The same idea, this this is a... This is the, the translation for the ESV is, is kind of taking what wouldn't make a lot of sense to us. Literally, it says, guard yourselves from his face. Okay? What it, they translated into something that would make more sense to us. Pay careful attention to him. I do believe that that's what it actually means. But it's, you miss the whole point is that his point is to guard us on the way and also that there is a command here to guard yourselves from his face. Okay? So this keeping, protecting, protect yourself from his face. This is very important. Obey his voice. That's another way of looking at this. So it's a parallel to this. And do not rebel against him. Another insight as to what does this mean to pay careful attention, to guard yourself from his face. Because he will not pardon your transgressions for my name is in him. Isn't this fascinating? Yahweh's name is in him, like I already said, that means it is God. He is the angel of the Lord. But to listen to him and do not be bitter is what the word means. Sin against him. Do not be bitter or defy his authority. Do not be rebellious. Don't hate him. Don't be a hater. 
for he will not forgive your sins. Isn't that fascinating? Because Jesus actually, when he becomes incarnate, his purpose is to bring forgiveness of sins to us. And here's the other thing. The more that we learn about what this tabernacle is, that Moses is going to be given this blueprint shortly, the blueprint we learn later, the tabernacle is Jesus. It is a symbol of Jesus. And what the tabernacle is, is duplicated in the temple. The layout of it is identical. So the tabernacle will be the system for forgiveness of sins. They don't have that yet though. So God is going to bring them into the fullness of what it is. The angel of the Lord is going to bring them into that. And part of it is that is forgiveness of sins is going to be actually addressed in the tabernacle. So all which points to this very being and what he will do. He will bring forgiveness of sins. Jesus has different roles as guardian, protector, power, guide for God's people into God's promises to come into the covenant. He will also guide them into God's forgiveness and bring peace. Fascinating. So God's people must follow this angel. If they have faith, they will follow him. Isn't that what God said ultimately to Adam and Eve? That's what faith is. Faith is following. If we believe in something, we follow. You can't believe in it. I mean, our current culture believes that we can say we believe in it, but we don't follow it. Well, I believe in that, but I'm not going to do it. God would say this doesn't make any sense. If you believe in it, then you do it. Because that's really where, you know, the tires meet the road. It, it's not going, you're not going to do something. It's because you don't believe in it. That, that tells you right there, you don't believe in it. So if they have faith, they will follow him. God will be hostile if they do this. If they follow him, then God promises, I will be this word hostile, an enemy to your enemies. Hostile is what literally it means to those who are hostile to you. And I will attack your attackers. When I first read this, I was like, oh, that must be the word for Satan uh, in the New Testament, whatever. But it's actually the adversary to your adversaries. I will attack your attackers. I will be hostile to those who are hostile to you. And I will attack your attackers. Here's the deal. In Deuteronomy chapter 20 verses 1 through 4. Deuteronomy is Moses' farewell address. Okay, Jesus has his in the book of John from chapters 14 through 17. But um, Moses' is the whole book of Deuteronomy. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 20, um, Moses is in Deuteronomy, he's instructing Israel how you go forward and succeed in the presence of God. Remember what has happened along the way in the past. Learn from your mistakes. And this is how we go forward successfully. Okay, in 20, Deuteronomy 20, verses 1 through 4, he says, When you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, presence, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Same God that rescued you from Egypt is still with you to fight against these enemies. And when you draw near to the battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the people and shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. In order for God to fight for us, we have to follow him. We have to listen to him. Because if we listen to him, then he will move us along that, that process of sanctification, which is what we talked about in the first section. And that sanctification will bring us more and more and more into his image and likeness. And so it unifies us to his purpose, to his heart, to what he loves, we love. And this is all part of what the fear of the Lord is also. That we hate what he hates. We love what he loves. 
We become more transformed into his image and likeness. And all of this is because that's what the angel of the Lord does is to bring us in. And Jesus did that, but now gives us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit takes over, bringing us in, taking us along the way is the power and the presence and the hope and life and transformation process. All of it, the fulfillment of the covenant, all of it comes from the presence of God. All of it. In order for, for God to fight for us and be hostile to those that are hostile against us, we need to be unified to him. And those that are people that, ah, he's talking legalism. No, I'm not. It's not a matter of being, we've already talked about this in the past. Legalism is, is something of earning your salvation. Of, of, and that is not what Jesus is about we can't do it on our own apart from him. It's surrender to the guiding of the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. It's surrender, faith. That's what repentance and faith is. That's what he calls us into. Follow me. Follow me. And I will take you into eternal life. And eternal life we know in John 17, 3, which is also part of the farewell address, is it, eternal life is to know the Father, intimate relationship to know the Father and the one whom he has sent, Jesus Christ. That's what he brings us into. Union. And we become part of the same team. All right, so in chapter 24, the covenant is confirmed with Israel. They have a meal with them. The elders do. They see God. Moses is called up to the top of Mount Sinai to receive the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. And also, he... Um, he will receive the, uh, the instructions for the tabernacle as well. Okay, so in chapter 25, the next slide, verse 1 and then also 8 and 9. Actually, it's 1 and 2 and then 8 and 9 as well. There's something I just want to highlight here because it is important. It says here, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel that they take from me a contribution from every man whose heart moves him. You shall receive the contribution for me. And then a few uh, verses later in verse 8 and 9, and that let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst exactly as I show you. Not Kind of, you know, just get it close. Exactly. There's a reason for it. Because the purpose of this tabernacle, this tent that he's going to teach him to build, there's a purpose for it. Every part of it has a specific purpose. And it is to be created exactly. The measurements and everything. Perfectly. It needs to be done perfectly. Perfectly. Because if we want to come into the salvation of God, we have to understand how to walk that path. It's walking. It's a journey. It is important. There are stops along the way. There are things that are important along the way. But they, it is important for us to understand the entire journey. And who is the one that this journey, the tabernacle, is actually a foreshadow of? Christ. It shows us the journey of Christ. Christ. And how to come into the forgiveness of sins and embrace the presence of God. Which we're going to look at in a second. Only those who want to be a part of the building of God's dwelling. That's an appropriate contribution. It's an honor to participate in the construction, the building, and the preservation of the tabernacle of the temple. I've had people before where they, you know, sometimes they say, do we have to pray or do we have to give? Do I have to, gosh, I hate sermons that are on tithing or whatever. And here's my answer to them. You know what? No, you don't. In fact, with that heart, don't give. God doesn't want your contribution if you are bitter. The same word that was there before. Bitter to the angel. To resist him, to rebel against him, don't do it. If you have a bitter heart in giving, if you really don't want to and you rebel against this as far as, it's, it's an ask. Speak to the people, let them take for me a contribution for those whose heart moves them. And you receive that contribution. Only those who have a grateful heart, who want to be a part of it, who consider it to be an honor. 
all of the, the oppression in history of all kinds of the, even the, the crusades and stuff like that, of forcing people to come under Christ and it's for their salvation, for their eternal salvation. It's for their benefit. You know what God would look at that? And say, it's junk. You don't force people to accept me. It's not how it works. That's not how he works. It's not his way. It's love. It's a choice. Otherwise, he wouldn't have given us a free will in the first place. By the fact of us forcing other people to accept him, it shows that we're not his workers. There was not something of him at all. And yet it often gets tagged on him because it was the church that led it. It wasn't his way. It's not the way he works. Choice. If we consider it an honor to be part of the building of his temple, that's what he wants. And we get to enjoy the fruits of the presence of God. If you don't want to take care of your church, it ain't going to be there very long. But you don't get to enjoy the presence of God being there in that community then. And if you want a better, a better church, then build one. Start with a Bible study or whatever it is. And God will bring and create and so forth. It's not easy. Trust me, I know. It's hard. But if you trust in God, God is with you. You follow him. And he will be hostile to those that are hostile against you. An enemy to your enemies. The point of the sanctuary, the tabernacle, is that God would dwell among them. The presence of God is the entire point of the whole Bible. And I've said this so many times. The very beginning of the Bible, we have God's presence. Dwelling with humanity, no separation. Chapter 3, sin comes in. We are separated from God because of that disobedience. And now the rest of the Bible is telling us how God is, what he is doing to bring us back into his presence. And it continues to happen increasingly throughout. The Exodus is a huge step, but we have Abraham that is someone, Noah is someone, you know, Abraham is another thing. And, and then we have Moses and then we have David and then we, it continues and it falls away and there's exile and but then Jesus comes and he ends up giving us the, the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, again, it's all about the presence of God, embracing his presence in a more and more intimate way. And Jesus makes it where God lives in us, not just among us in a tent over there and in our camp or close to us in our city or whatever. He's in us. He goes with each and every one of us. In fact, um. Well, we're going to see here in just a second that the tabernacle itself is, um, well, you know what? I'll come back to that. So they must follow the pattern revealed to Moses exactly because it will deal with the issue of sin so that there would not be a separation between God and his people anymore. And that's what you see in verse 9. Exactly as I show you concerning the patterns of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so you shall make it. So, Let's go to the next slide. There's a, I have a picture here, and the next number of slides are actually um, images of, of the tabernacle. In chapters 25 through 30, the plans for the tabernacle and the garments for the priests is, is covered. And so, all of this is extremely important. The exact details are gone through, and Moses is instructed, make sure that you follow these precisely. What does that tell you? about God and his salvation plan. For those that say, you know, every religion is just kind of a different way to God. Does that go along with his word? How he ends up instructing us? If he's that particular about how he ends up making the tabernacle where it's, I mean, it's everything from the measurements and what you use and what kind of metal and how many, as far as pieces of, of cloth and which cloth that you use and everything. I mean, it is very detailed. The answer is no. He is very specific about his salvation and we need to make sure we understand it. Very important. So, this tabernacle, it is, it's not that impressive. I mean, this is, a, yeah, it's like a Lego kind of a, of a uh, image of it, but it is very close to what it most likely looked like. This kind of a, a square box kind of thing that had a, a covering over it. Um, it's protect mostly from the sun, but 
Either way, this, this is, we're going to see all the details in just a second what it's, what it's for. But it's so that God would be able to go with them as they traveled through the wilderness and came into the land and ultimately in their war journeys and stuff as well. So the journey into God is also going to be represented here as we look at the tabernacle. Once in the promised land, they will build the sanctuary, the temple like I talked about before. So Pentecost is something. May 28th is when Pentecost is coming up. So just in a couple weeks. Pentecost, I guarantee you most people that are watching this don't even know what it is or have never celebrated it. Unless you are a Pentecostal church, um, who embrace the Holy Spirit wholeheartedly and so forth. It, um, you probably don't even, you've never even celebrated Pentecost. Pentecost is one of the most holy days. In fact, I would say you have Christmas, birth of Christ, Easter, cross and resurrection, and then Pentecost. It is the culmination of them all. It is the highlight of them all. It is the grand finale of them all. It is the only one that has not been um, uh, consumerized or whatever with, with buying stuff and, and cards and bunnies or chocolate bunnies and candy and, and gifts and, and just made the world has not stepped in on Pentecost. It is the day that we were given the presence of God. It's the best day of it all. I mean, you need Christmas in order to have Pentecost. You need the cross and resurrection to have Pentecost. But all of those things happened to give us Pentecost. I hope that you celebrate it. I hope even if it is in your own heart that you recognize this is like by far the, the, the most important of, of it all. This is what Jesus, why he did what he did. He did this to prepare a place for us. The, pre the place that he prepared was place in us for God to dwell he made a tabernacle in us. He made us able to embrace the presence of God. Now the presence of God goes with every believer like the tabernacle. And even in John chapter 1 verse 14, it says the word became flesh, meaning Jesus, and he was tabernacled among us. So he walked with us. He journeyed with us. And the whole point is what Jesus does. He is the tabernacle. We're going to see in a second. You're going to understand what I mean by that. But he ultimately, what he does makes it so that the tabernacle is no longer necessary. When Jesus says, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. He's talking about himself. And what he does is ultimately he resurrects. So he rebuilt it. He is the tabernacle. But also... Those that trust in him, he gives purity, uh, forgiveness for sins, and now the ability to receive the presence of God, not in the tabernacle, in us. By far, greatest thing, and we don't celebrate it in our churches. Tons of reasons why. Definitely not what I'm going to go into in this sermon, though. He revealed himself to us and taught us how to live in his presence. All right, so the next slide. Everything outside the yellow box is the courtyard of, the, ta of the, the tabernacle. So the courtyard, everything in the courtyard was bronze. That means, and even the metals had important meaning behind them. It was highly image um, based. And they got that from, from Egypt. That was something that was heavy in Egypt. So makes sense. They've lived there for about 400 years of course their culture is going to rub off on them. And not only that, but Moses, most likely, um, he was the prince of, of a, uh, whether she's a queen, a princess of Egypt. He was, he was raised in understanding these things very, very deeply. If Hatshepsut, Hatshepsut, if that is who his mother was, which I do believe that she is the one that uh, adopted him in the Exodus. Again, a whole nother subject matter. Her temple alone that she had built has a place in it that is called the Holy of Holies, which is exactly what the tabernacle has. Um, 
God takes our context and he speaks into it. Jesus speaks to sheep herders with imageries of sheep and farmers with imageries of farming, parables and so forth, and fishermen about fish. He's going to take what Moses knows about temples and so forth, and he speaks into it and reveals himself in those realities. So, anyways, um, the altar which is there, the altar of sacrifice, that little square thing. It was a place where sacrifices were all offered. It was very bloody, and there was fire there, meant to horrify us regarding sin and the effects of it and the demands that God requires for forgiveness. That is where we would see the cross. That is where sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin, something had to die right there. It's important for us to understand, in order for us to come into the presence of God, something has to die to pay the price for sin. Otherwise, there's no way we come into God's presence. It is essential. Immediately, as soon as you come in to the courtyard, bam, you've got to address the issue of sin. And that's why other religions and stuff where they say, well, can't you just come to God in any way? No, because it, none of them address the issue of sin with God. And even if they did, there's nothing that addresses it like God himself being the ultimate sacrifice that pays the price for the sins of the world. Essential. So sacrifice, bam, right up there. Bloody, smelly, horrifying. But it also is where God allows for substitutionary atonement, grace, mercy to restore our relationship. So there's an amazing beauty that's there as well. Life. So there's death and life. And doesn't that, isn't that what Jesus says? In order to come into life, you have to be willing to die. Die to self. Live for God. So, this um, laver is the, is the, the uh, large basin that's used for washing. Again, this would be bronze. It's for the priests. And before they enter into the tabernacle, they are the mediators who end up coming in to the temple. And they're the only ones that are actually able to even take this journey. So again, that is why that it's so pronounced and profound that when Jesus says that after his resurrection and that we receive the Holy Spirit, we are all a kingdom of priests. We're all priests. Only the priest could actually take this journey and to get all the way to the Holy of Holies where God's presence was, only the high priest could do that. Only one person out of the entire nation. Now we are all high priests. Amazing. So anyways, um, they must be clean though. They must be washed and holy to enter into God's presence. So it's another image of being clean from sin, pure, holy. Also, the importance of holiness, we miss that. And so we don't understand it as Christians because we don't like texts like Leviticus, which is all about holiness. All right, so the next slide. Um, so here you see, this is a, a bigger picture of the tabernacle. So the inside of the tabernacle, you have two sections in the tabernacle. You have the holy place and then the holy of holies. And like I had said, as far as with um, uh, before, the holy of holies is where God's presence is. Everything in the tabernacle was gold. That is divinity. It's an image for divinity. You are in the presence of a divine being. Again, definitely from Egypt. So the holy place had three items. Okay, this is the first thing that you enter into. You enter into it and it had three items in it. The lampstand, which would be on the left and uh, represents the light of the world, which is Jesus, absolutely. Um, the table of showbread, which is uh, and the, where the bread is. So bread was baked and it had 12 different um, loaves that were there representing the 12 tribes. And so Jesus saying he is the bread of life as well. Um, the gold altar that is right in front of the entrance into the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, is where prayer was done, where incense was offered. And the incense, the smoke was an image of prayers ascending up to God into heaven. All of these things Jesus gives us access to. He teaches us to pray. He also is the light of the world. He is the bread of life. All of these things, this light that in the lampstand never went out. It was the eternal flame that never was put out. Um, I have no idea how they actually had that when they traveled, how they did that. But either way, never went out. 
So the Holy of Holies then is the most inner part. It is the only part that is a perfect square in every direction. A cube. Um, The Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant is. Again, everything is gold. It's where, the Ark of the Covenant is God's presence. It basically is referred to as his footstool. So his throne is up in heaven. His footstool is the Holy of, is the um, Ark of the Covenant. And there were two cherubim. So the cherubim are angelic beings, four heads, four wings, eyes all over them. They come into the picture at, in Genesis, uh, right after Genesis 3, with the sin, and when Adam and Eve are kicked out, they guard against them coming into the garden and eating from the tree of life and being cursed forever. So they are kind of guardians between God and humanity, more for us than for God. We're no threat to him, but it's, it's for our good. So they guard there his presence, and um, that is called the mercy seat. It's where actually uh, Moses would have talked with God and also where the high priest um, would convene um, and pray before God once a year. All right, so the next slide. So this here is a picture, and I, I wanted to show you just the, the path of walking through this. It's a cross. It's an image of a cross, Jesus is the tabernacle of God. And this journey that we have to walk through in the tabernacle is something that is in the shape of a cross. He says um, in John 14, verse 6, that I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Nobody came to the Father except through the tabernacle. It's the only way that they were able to do it. Nobody comes to the Father still except through Jesus. He is the way. He is the journey. He is the truth of it. No deception. No lies. And it always leads to life. True life. There is a specific way to approach God revealed in this tabernacle of sacrifice, of cleansingness and holiness, that, and then a provision of light and bread and also prayer that we have access to before him, communion with God. All of these things are there to show us this way. And in Exodus 23 verse 20, it says, Behold, I send an angel before you. To guard you on the way. To bring you into the place that I prepared. That's what we started off with here today. I send an angel before you to guard you on the way. To bring you into the place that I have prepared for you. This is all Jesus. The high priest walked the way, the path to approach Yahweh and for Israel to live in his presence. Their garments represented their role and royalty, their importance, their holiness. They had to be white garments of linen. This was all holiness, purity. Holiness is an essential part of embracing God's presence. And again, that's not something I'm going to get into today. But it's something that is lost. We don't understand it. I guarantee you most of the people watching today, they don't understand. In fact, the ones that think they understand it will say, well, I am made holy and pure at the cross through Christ and it's all done. Wrong. Yes, you are made holy and pure to be able to receive the Holy Spirit in that sense. You are forgiven for all sins. But the holiness and is, is being able to walk with God and that sanctification of growing in holiness. That is something that continues every day of embracing him, walking with him, purity and repentance. All of that stuff is important to be clean, understanding the priest's job overall for Israel was to teach the importance and the difference between clean clean and unclean, holy and common. We don't understand those things. Again, another subject, another sermon. God is truly the author of salvation. He always knew what the plan was. He revealed the pattern at Mount Sinai through Moses, seen first in the tabernacle. All right, let's move to the next slide. The final slide for today And this is chapter 31, verse 1 through 6. It says, The Lord said to Moses, 
See, I have called by name Bezalel. His name means under God's shadow. The son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God. And this is fascinating. So three withs statements that are going to be here. But the next four items are describing what being filled with the spirit entails. So this north, south, east, west, completely, totally, I'm giving him everything he needs. And so I filled him with the spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, knowledge and all craftsmanship. And what does that mean? So a breakdown, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze. Those are the three metal elements. Silver meant um, purity uh, refinement, um, pure. So in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahismak, the tri- of the tribe of Judah, and I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. So first of all, Uri, his name means the light of Yahweh, enlightened, fiery presence. Her, we've already seen her. Her is actually somebody that was with Aaron and Moses on the mountain when they were fighting against Amalek in chapter 17. Um, her is someone, uh, his name means noble, splendor, white, pure. He is someone of nobility and highly respected. Um, either way, um, so this is his son, Bezalel. And a son of something shows you also of, of who his father is, but what his descendant is, it tells you about his character and his line. Tribe of Judah, Judah means the praise of God. So um, God has called and equipped the manufacturer of this temple with his spirit and has given him all ability to do everything that he needs to do. Not only that, but he also gives him helpers to assist him. First of all, he'll have a right-hand person, a Holiab, which his name means my father's tent. So, my father's tabernacle. And Ahisamach, his name means brother of support. So, all of this is showing that God has given um, Bezalel everything that he needs and Israel all that they need to be able to build this thing. Not only does God show this stuff, but he also gives the workers and everything. So it's not only even just Bezalel, but also Holiab, the right hand, and then all the other able men and workers. I've given you them also the ability to do everything as well. We see that God has these four I have statements. I have called Bezalel. I have filled him with everything that he needs in order to have the skill to do what's necessary. I have the third one. I have appointed with him a right hand person, a holy ab. And then fourth, I have given him also all other men that he needs with abilities to fulfill this. Four, I have statements, north, south, east, west. I've given you everything that you need to complete this. I mean, what else do we have that's left to do it? Why doesn't God just do it? Why doesn't he just, boom, hey, Moses, watch this. Hey, look, we've got the tabernacle. It's all made. It's all done. You know, just relax, Moses. You know, you're old. You're just relaxing. Everybody else, you know, I, I had this guy, Bezalel, in mind. But you know what? Forget Bezalel, you know, and Aholiab. And we don't need Aholiab either. We'll just, I'll just do it for you. God gives us this, but he also calls us in to be a part of it, to build it. We have to do our part. We have our part. Yes, he does all the heavy lifting, meaning the things that we aren't even capable of doing and the things that we are. He gives us those skills as well. He provides everything. He gives us an angel on the way to prepare the way. He gives us Jesus ultimately, which is the fulfillment of all of it, who is actually the same person. He gives us a tabernacle to be able to give Give us temporary forgiveness until we come into the fullness of what Jesus is going to do. He gives us everything. Everything is laid out. 
God gives us presence. He gives us skill. They have to contribute from a free will and a heart that wants to be a part of this. This is what following looks like. Do you want to be a part of what God is doing? He'll give you all that you need, but you have to be willing to follow him. And what part of that path actually shows is that you have to be willing to die to you in order to come into true life. Sin has to be dealt with. And yes, Jesus did what we can't do. But still Jesus says, you got to pick up your cross and follow me. And what that's going to do is purge you, that fire that you got to walk through. That altar, the bronze altar. Jesus died for us, but you still got to die to self. That's where we die. And then are cleansed. And then we receive the light of the world and the bread of life. And prayer that now is connected to God. And we come into his presence. It all comes together. And Jesus made that path even able because he went first. Just like he goes ahead of Israel. He goes before us. He paves the way. But he says, you got to follow me. All of this stuff. Does it sound like it's a pattern at all? Because it's an identical pattern to what happens in the Exodus. Follow me. If you listen to me and follow me, I will be your healer. Remember the trees, the oaks at Elim, the covenant, the, the deal, the testing that God gives to Israel right after they end up coming through the Red Sea. If you listen to me, none of the plagues that came against Egypt will come upon you because I am the Lord, your healer. Listen to me. You listen to me, I will save you and I will lead you into your fulfillment of what your purpose is. The place that I've prepared for you. So many Christians, they want the eternal life, but they don't want to follow. And so they never come into the fullness of what God has really in plan for us. They never come into the place prepared. And you have bad teachers that they give you partial truths, but because they're afraid to not be popular, people don't want to suffer. That's why you never hear any kind of sermons on it, you know, or idolatry, because we love those things. And it might make them unpopular, but what is that? Should, that should remind you that those are false prophets, false teachers. They're more concerned about themselves and they fear man more than they fear God. Again, there's the fear God little plug. Learning why that's important. Our Bible study, Tuesday nights. It's important to understand the path, the way, and all the things that God gives us because they are all what we need. You can't cut any of them out. They're all necessary in order for us to come into the place that he's prepared for us. It's essential. The only part of this in the whole relation is to listen and to follow because we believe in the name of Yahweh, the living God, and that his word is truth. We have a role to play as God's people, and it is to listen carefully and to follow everything Yahweh tells us because we believe in him. Will we do our part? Will you do your part? Are you willing to follow Christ to your cross, your cross? Are you willing to die to self in order to come into true life? Are you willing to hold up everything that is yours and say, God, take any of it because I trust you. We often have to get to a place ourselves where we realize we've screwed it all up ourselves. I know that's what it was for me. When I came to a place where I said, when I was in charge, I almost took my own life. I obviously don't know what I'm doing. So God, I surrender my life to you and I'm going to trust you because I, I quit as being king in my life. I'm going to let you be king. And so that means I'm your servant. So I follow you. And when you say to follow you, and these are the things that I need to do, I'm going to follow you. It's not legalism. Surrender. Not earning anything in my journey. I'm simply, I'm surrendering. I'm following. 
if we are following him, he promises to go with us, to be hostile to those who are hostile against us, to fight, to be an enemy against our enemies, an adversary against our adversaries, to attack those who attack us. May we listen carefully and follow Yahweh's words. Join him in his ministry to this world that is trapped in darkness. May we be light in this world. May we come into the purpose that we were made for. We are saved for a purpose, and that is to be light, to be a witness of what God's presence has done for us, and then to invite other people into it. And God will be glorified. We've got to be willing to be sanctified, to be continually growing in his image and likeness in order for us to be harmonized with each other. It's not perfect. That's what grace is for, but we need to be growing. That's what this whole first section was today in our service. The importance of willingness to grow in Christ, embracing the sanctification process. May we embrace it and may God be glorified in all of it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. Thank you for this message. We thank you for your presence and for your power, for your love, for how awesome that you are. Pray that every person that listens to this would truly understand, maybe that this would even open up their eyes to something new and inspire them to go forward a little stronger a little more mature in you, and that, again, you would be glorified. Please be with us, Lord. Help us to truly embrace you in truth. Protect us from deception. And we pray all this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Before we end our service, I just want to remind you, and I've kind of already reminded you that we have a, a Bible study on Tuesday nights. We are looking at the fear of the Lord. It is an incredible study. Is not something a lot of people really understand. They think that it's something to fear God, to run from him, and to be terrified of him. That's not what it is, but it sounds like that because the fear of the Lord, that's what we normally would associate it with. It is way deeper than that. Much, 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 much more. And so this is not a study to argue about why you don't like the fear of the Lord. This is something to sit to learn why it is an important thing because everything in the Bible talks about the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge. All of Christians, even letters, some letters in the New Testament are talked about as being written to those who fear God. And also even the book of Revelation addresses those who are the saints or the ones who fear God, who understand. So do you know what it means to fear God? It's important. Tuesday nights, 6.30 to 8.30. At 6 o'clock, we have a prayer session. We, can, uh, we do it on Zoom and also in person. And in person, we do it in Dodgeville at my and my wife's home. If you are interested, you can send us an email at info at lhchurch.net. Let us know which one you want to do and we'll send you the right information. Other than that, we are contemplating on possibly changing our services to Be on a a Sunday morning. We'll let you know for sure next week because that will happen in two weeks if we do it. Um, So next week it'll still be same time. What is it? Four o'clock Saturday night right now. So next week will still be four o'clock at Saturday. However, next week we'll let you know for sure we are praying about possibly transferring our service to Sunday mornings at 9.30 most likely a.m. And so... Uh, We'll let you know next week, so stay tuned. A little teaser there for you also. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful week. God bless.